Lady Aurelia down the centre in the white and green colours is going away at the end. Rachel's Valentina rattled her and takes the lead. In 2020, everything changed. But we kept going. Because despite the challenges, we all share a commitment to the industry, to the community, to the horse, to come together when it matters most, as we always have, as we always will. Hi, my name is Gary Falter with the Jockey Club. I'd like to welcome each of you to today's online panel. This is the seventh panel in the 2021 series of 10 online Zoom panels. Today's panel talks about a relatively new ownership option, racing clubs and microshare ownership. And today you'll learn about how these new ownership options are having a positive impact on our industry. And please keep in mind as the panel progresses and you have a question for the panelists, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit a question. And at the end of the panel, we'll answer as many of your questions as time allows. The Owner Conference Series is hosted by the Jockey Club and Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association. I'd also like to thank today's panel sponsors, starting with the Daily Racing Forum, Mersant Equine Transportation, and My Racehorse. The support of all the sponsors makes it possible to hold this event at no charge to you. And our sincere thanks to all the sponsors for their continued support of Thoroughbred Ownership. We hope you enjoy today's panel and we'll return next month when we have a panel that talks about biomechanics and racehorses. Today's moderator is TVG racing analyst and former trainer, Simon Gray. Thank you, Simon, for being with us today and please take it from here. Thanks very much, Gary. Thanks for the introduction and uh, very happy to be here. Glad so many of you could join us on this Tuesday afternoon. Well, I think it's going to be a fascinating panel and one of, one of the, uh, it's kind of been close to my heart uh, ever since I, I was born and raised in this industry, attracted new people to the sport. A little background on me and then I'll get out of the way and introduce the panelists. Many of you know me from, uh, from TVG. I've been an employee there for about uh, 18 years prior to that. Um, I, I was a trainer for Alan Parson prior to that, worked for Bill Martin as assistant trainer and was born and raised in England and grew up around horse racing uh, ever since from the age of about 12 when I used to, you know, the whole cliche, go to the races with my father who owned horses um, and spent some time working for uh, champion trainer Henry Cecil before coming, before coming to the United States. And now I'm in my current role as an analyst and broadcaster for TVG. Okay, enough about me. Let's move on to our discussion and our panel. As I mentioned at the top, attracting new people to the game has been actually, you know, at the, at the back of my mind for a long time. Even when I was training, I always used to host a lot of groups and to this day try to bring new people to the races. So this panel has a lot of interest for me. And currently there's several ways to get into to thoroughbred ownership, whether it's sole ownership, 100% ownership of a horse on your own, whether it's racing partnerships, uh, whether it's syndicates or one of the newest racing ventures out there, uh, microshare ownership. And this next panel includes a group of representatives that will talk on all the above. So first of all, I'd like to introduce each and every one of them. I'll start with Gary Palmansano from the Churchill Downs Racing Club. Great background, great history. He's worked on the backside, the front side, and brings the combination of both to his current role as uh, the manager of the Churchill Downs Racing Club. He's son of a longtime trainer, equine management and marketing degrees at the University of Louisville. He's worked uh, at Churchill Downs for the last 10 years in various roles in, in, in the perimutrial department marketing, now in his current role as uh, the head of the Churchill Downs Racing Club. Mary Cage joins us from Windstar Stablemates, kind of a similar background. Uh, she's her second stint at Windstar, she in turn a Windstar for a couple of years in 2017, 2018, um, throughout college summers. Um, and then she worked for trainer Graham Motion, getting that backside experience, which I think is vital in her current role. And then moved to the administrative side on the front side, working at Lone Star in the racing office and the marketing department. And ever since January of last year, she's headed up the Windstar Stablemates 
partnership group. And last and foremost is Michael Behrens. He heads up MyRacehorse.com, uh, one of the new fractional ownerships, micro share ownerships. Uh, it's the first ever fully securities compliant micro share racehorse ownership platform. He has a long history in marketing, having marketed, managed over $800 million in marketing accounts through the years. And ever since 2017, when he's got into horse racing, started up MyRacehorse.com. And we'll hear more from him later on about what that is and currently what they're doing going forward. All right, let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start off with Gary, the racing manager for the Churchill Downs Club. Gary, in 2016, my first question to you, Churchill launched its first edition of the Churchill Downs Racing Club. Talk about how this idea got started, what it's expanded to, and where it's going. What's the ultimate goal for the Churchill Downs Racing Club? Thanks, Simon, uh, and happy to be here today and represent not only the racing club, but a couple of great organizations that, to your point, are bringing in new people to the sport. Um, sometime around late 2015, our management team at Churchill Downs looked around and said, um, the ownership pie is shrinking a little bit, um, and we need to find ways to bring new owners into the sport. Uh, owners, you know, obviously... Um, contribute a whole lot to the industry. They're, they're a linchpin group that kind of supply the horses that ultimately our betters wager on and, and ultimately keep the, the racing going. And we looked up one day and said, you know what, the, the game is shrinking a little bit from the owner's side. Um, we need to, to have more owners. We need to have them more involved. We need to provide new experiences for them. And we kind of kicked around a couple of different ideas. And, and I got to tip my hat to the folks at Emerald Downs I think they created sort of this first concept of the racing club, but we really felt like if we put Churchill Downs' name behind it and the things that, that we can do here from our social media teams and with the Derby and whatnot, that we could really expand upon the program that was created at, at another track. And that's exactly what we did in 2016. We, we launched the club and um, the, the really interesting part or the fun part was when we sat around and tried to figure out which trainer would be willing to take on 200 racing club members um, and we kicked around a couple of ideas and and ultimately you know what what really got the program going was when Wayne Lucas signed on to train the first horse and and Wayne is so great and was so gracious with his time and was was the absolute perfect person to talk about the industry and to talk about racehorse ownership and to really um, you know, get people's attention and get them involved so in 2016 we set out with the task of selling out the first racing club uh, which was a $500 investment uh, for 200 people, uh, which generated us $100,000 in capital. We bought our first horse uh, for $50,000 named Warriors Club, and he sort of set the whole thing off for us. He rattled off over $800,000 in wins and a, a grade three win at Keeneland. And, and ultimately that got people so excited. And, and then in this day and age with social media, they told their friends who told their friends. And then the racing club has kind of blossomed into what it is today, which is uh, on our ninth group now, each with 200 people and, and going strong. That's amazing. Great story. I mean, we'll get into to some more details of some of the things you bring up. I think are very interesting, particularly for this panel. Social media, I think, has, has driven your clubs and, and outfits uh, exponentially over the last couple of years. And uh, what a get getting D-Way. I mean, that's like having Tom Brady launch a startup venture. I mean, you couldn't have picked a better face for the sport to get going. Yeah, we didn't really have to twist his arm. We just told him we were going to get right. a microphone and let him and have an audience and he would just go on with it. And, and that's all Wayne needed. <laughs> oh, and some yeah. money to go to the sales with. <laughs> okay. All right, Mary, let's move on to you. I'll, I'll, I'll basically ask you the same question. Windstar stable mates. I mean, kind of similar operation. If there are any differences, maybe point them out. But where did you start? What are you doing now? And what's the future for Windstar stable mates? Sure. Thanks, Simon. And you know, thanks for everybody for putting this panel on. But um, so what's cool about Windstar Stablemates is it didn't even start as a syndicate. It started as a fan club initiative back in 2011. So that was shortly after Windstar won its first derby with Super Saver in 2010. And it kind of gathered a, a good following of fans. And so the farm put together this fan club called Stablemates, and that kind of allowed them, um, you know, an exclusive all access look um, into what goes on at the farm and with our resources and obviously Windstar as a farm encompasses all aspects in the industry from breeding and um, yearlings to, to racing. And then of course our stallion. So um, it really started from that standpoint, um, being education and give them, you know, live webcams, um, daily videos, all sorts of educational content. Um, but as time went on, 
and these members really kind of wanted to explore more um, within the industry, particularly ownership. And so, you know, our CEO, Elliot, and our owner, uh, Kenny Trout, they kind of took a step back and kind of assessed what was um, a possibility for them to, to extend that experience. And, you know, with so many members wanting to explore ownership, they decided to um, form a syndicate. And what we did um, was make that syndicate a group of our, our fillies, mostly our homebred fillies, and um, sell like the uh, shares to the racing rights of these fillies. And so really the goal all along with Stablemates, even when it was originally just a fan club was to educate you know, the fan base behind the, the Thorbett industry and hopefully um, allow that to lead to new owners. And with uh, initiating Stablemates as a syndicate in 2018, it did exactly that. And I would say education has definitely remained a, a center point of Stablemates. You know, we still put out newsletters, things like that, just to kind of really help guide them as they they venture into the ownership side of things, especially since, as we all know, partnerships kind of help um, exclude some of that risk as you first enter um, racehorse ownership. Mary, great answer. And I, you bring up a good point. I think education, I think, I think we're going to see that as a common theme as we weave through this next hour or so, because yeah, the race day experience is great. And that's ultimately what people sign up for. But along with that, and we'll touch on it later, is a great educational experience. What goes into getting to the horse and the behind the scenes access, I think is great for new members. Okay, let's move on. Finally, to, to Michael, I'll ask you the same question. Your business model and structure is a little different from, from Gary's and Mary and the fact that you only got involved in this in 2017. It's a micro share ownership. You know, it involves securities, et cetera. So it's totally different. Give the audience a little bit of your background. I think you, you have a marketing background. Was this something that was always in the plans? Have you been a long time horse fan or did you just, you know, decide to do this in the last five years? Again, how did you start, where it's at and what's the future hold for MyRacehorse.com? So just quick little uh, caveat here. I have a little unstable internet connection. So if you lose me for a second, uh, I'll jump back on here. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so, uh, as you said, I started uh, not in the game. I had always been a fan of racing, uh, but I was in ad tech and marketing for 20 years. I ran an ad agency in Pasadena, California, and then I became the CMO of a company called Casper that sold mattresses in a box. Uh, and so I had used Saturdays to go to the races and basically just decompress. And I've always loved the sport um, and became frustrated by its lack of overall growth. Uh, and what I, what I believed was that, that horse racing lacked trial of the greatest aspects of the sport. And if you could get people involved in ownership, if you could get people to have a vested interest in the horse, that you could really provide the greatest trial to our sport. Gamble, Gambling is kind of hard to get people to, to go in for the first time. But there's something very simple about owning $100, owning a hair of a racehorse. There's something simple and binary about it. And that's where my racehorse was kind of born, was the idea that we could provide all fans the opportunity to have an equity interest in a racehorse. When you talk about securities, the biggest problem about why this is never scaled is that the Securities Exchange Commission basically says that if you want to advertise to unaccredited investors, people who have less than a million dollars in the bank, or don't make $250,000 a year, then you have to be a qualified security. This was not some brilliant idea I came up with. I have met many smart people who decided that wanted to go down this route, but the issue was how do you overcome the fact that you need to be a regulated security? And then on top of that, how would you manage 10, 20, 100,000 people? So luckily enough, I was able to partner with a really great law firm that was able to get us the legal construct to go live. And in 2019, we were given a uh, qualification using Reg A Tier 2 to be able to raise $75 million a year and use online advertising. So it was a securities play that really kind of allowed us to unearth this microshare product. That's a fascinating story. Um, we'll dig into it a little further as we go along. This next portion of the panel, I, I'm going to have basically a standard question. I'll just throw it around the horn, the same question to everyone. Um, let's talk about numbers. Gary, we'll start with you. What's your sort of uh, inventory of, of owners? How many members do you have? And what's the, uh, the investment model and the economic structure? Say, you know, if Simon wants to jump in tomorrow, what's, what's the situation? Who am I jumping in with and how many people? Yeah, so our uh, 
racing club is structured a little differently. It's a 501c not-for-profit racing club. So the idea is there is no opportunity for um, you know profitable gain from the racing club. This is purely an experience. This is nothing more than joining a country club type atmosphere and being able to to congregate with friends and enjoy you know a common thing, uh, which in this case is owning a thoroughbred racehorse. So our program revolves around. Um, a $500 investment uh, for up to 200 members. Um, and that forms one club. Um, and we have, uh, I think we're up to nine clubs now. Each one has its own uh, individual investment. They're all independent of each other. So as one club does well, they sort of fund uh, the opportunity to purchase more horses or to keep on going. And as you know, the other club uh, horse doesn't produce, that club eventually uh, falls off. But um, the big part of our you know, situation is Church of Downs is attached to it. I think a lot of people felt confident that their $500 was going to go toward, you know, something. I think folks felt like um, they have the ability to come to the races. We provided general admission. Uh, we provided tours of the backside. We provided access that they didn't have um, beforehand, all for, you know, a fairly nominal $500 investment. And I think that gave people um, a little comfort level that, you know, Church of Downs is behind this. I'm getting some added perks as being a racing club member, whether I go to the races on a general day or not. And then once a club horse runs, given we are Churchill Downs and, and we try to have our horses race here at Churchill Downs, we're able to put on a, a big spread and a big party and try to have as many of them out here as possible, go to the paddock. And I think one of the, the more fun moments that we've had here was a horse winning here and lined up across the racetrack. I think all three of us have probably been in that situation where the track photographer is in a total meltdown trying to figure out where to put all these people. But, uh, but at the end of the day, the photographer comes out well because they all buy pictures and they all want to want to remember the moment that they were in the winner's circle at any prestigious racetrack. And, and the ability to do that here at Churchill Downs was, was a huge opportunity. But for us, it, it, unlike some of the others, there's no real profitable gain. We totally were focused on providing an experience. And in 2016, when we launched, the, the My Racehorses of the World weren't there. And we felt like this was a way to, to get those folks involved. And I think we, we've we seen uh, as Windstar and My Resource have done kind of pass the torch on to some of these newer ideas that allow for, for more risk and more investment. That's great. And, and, and I just want to clarify one question, maybe on all three of you. Um, if we enter into your club or venture, is it a one-time thing? Because that's one of the big questions I always got asked. When I was training, I was trying to attract new owners. I was very honest. I always used to say it's like disposable income. And you bring up the analogy of the country club. I think it's great. I think it's a country club. I think it's owning a yacht. You know, it's the, to, to me, when I was trying to bring new people in the game, I always said it's disposable income. It's income that, you know, you have to be able to, to, be able to part with, but it's not going to affect your lifestyle. So are, they, are these all one-time payments or you put up your $500 and all their monthly fees down the line? For, for my, uh, it's $500 one time. Um, and we, we utilize, we utilize the money until it runs dry. And hopefully, yep. you know, the idea is what we try to do is raise a hundred grand. I think personally, it's very important that you, you keep money on the side for the bills. Things happen with horses. So we try to have a $50,000 budget at the sale and we try to keep $50,000 back for expenses. We feel like that gives us at least eight to 12 months, um, in a given year to, to pay the trainer, to pay the vet to you know, put a horse on the shelf if, if something comes up and, and all those are educational things along the way. But, but our model is a $500, $500 one-time investment and we take the ride as long as we possibly can. That's, that's tremendous. I mean, you pay $500 to go to a ball game and it's over in four hours. We got a year long experience. That, that, that's fantastic. Mary, same question to you, Windstar Stable Mates. What's the economic model? How much is the buy-in? And do you have the same situation, one-time payment? Sure. I think that's what's really great about all these different clubs and partnerships is they all kind of work differently and are structured differently. And that gives people all these options. As for stablemates, the way it works is the Phillies are 100% owned by Windstar and we allocate that as 100 shares available, but you get the entire roster of Phillies. So for example, in 2021, we came in with 100 Phillies on the roster and that includes some graded stakes caliber Phillies. And so um, it is a one-time thing. We kind of charge them for the upfront training costs, kind of an estimate based on how many um, horses are in the stable that year. Um, so for example, this year with the, the 10 fillies and the partnership, um, we charge $5,000 upfront for training and general costs, plus a $750 
admin fee that was discounted for returning members who re-enrolled early. Um, but you know, the reason we do that is we, we just charge that money up front to kind of cover those bills and those costs. Like as Gary mentioned, things happen with horses as we all know all throughout the year. And so that kind of provides us um, the money to manage the syndicate throughout the year. Um, so, you know, anybody can buy however many shares they want. Um, but what's great about it is for less than $6,000, you're getting access to an entire roster of fillies versus just one horse. They don't have to invest individually in each horse. They get this entire roster, uh, including, including fillies that are competing at um, the stakes level. And so the way it works is it's just a, a lease of their racing rights for the calendar year. So at the end of the year, um, there is a chance for them to, you know, get some of the earnings back. We kind of um, divide it up between shareholders and it's kind of the net earnings after, um, you know, everything, all the um, cost versus earnings. Um, as you know, there's plenty of risk involved in owning racehorses, but, um, you know, there is right. a chance for to get some money back. That's fantastic. Tremendous. And then lastly, Michael, your situation, you kind of touched on it, you're security compliant, but what's the investment? And you're a little different from, from Gary and Mary in that, you know, you have an app. I mean, if I want to go on tomorrow when you've got an offer, I can just pick up my phone, tap a button and I'm in, right? That's right. Yeah. So we, are, the app is, uh, the app is the easy access uh, and we don't have one single type of offering. Uh, everything is inside its own company. Uh, inside his own series LLC. So if you, whatever horse you pick, you're financially invested in that racehorse and that racehorse only. And you can pick one horse, you can pick five. We have somebody who I think owns over 57 horses. Uh, so you can build your own stable. And that's the beauty about our low price points. We've continued to lower our minimum investment. I mean, we buy horses as much as, you know, seven figures, but we always try to create the minimum level to be less than $100. So our point is that we don't want to sacrifice quality um, for kind of what your minimum level is. So if you want to compete at the highest, highest level, but you don't want to do it for a very significant equity position, you could pick one share of a million dollar horse and pay a few dollars uh, for it and just kind of go on that journey. Or you can buy as many as you'd like. It is one-time payment. We take all the risk that the horse will be, be able to kind of pay its bills. So we, we collect some money up front, usually for about a year's worth of training. And then we manage the horse pred predicate on its profits uh, from prize money. So we reinvest some of it back into an escrow account others we distribute back to the shareholders as we go and then once this horse is sold we close out the series and distribute all the remaining equity back to the shareholders on a pro rata basis so we take some of the risk which takes all the pressure off you knowing the fact that if the horse has to have surgery if the horse isn't winning races and it goes into the negative then we'll hopefully we'll be able to figure out either through residual value at the sale or through prize money in a race how to be able to get the the company back to profitability and if we don't, we, we just wind up eating it and not passing it to our shareholders. Uh, we do leases. Uh, so we had Monomoy Girl, which was an amazing opportunity for people. We were able to, uh, Mr. B. Wayne Hughes and the Spendthrift team bought into her for $9.5 million at the Night of Stars. There was no way we could take an equity position in a horse like that. Uh, but they were kind enough to lease us this year's racing rights. So you could buy in and basically own a pro rata share of our racing rights for a very favorable deal. We also did that with Got Stormy, then had the luck of the four-star Dave happen just a couple of weeks ago, which was pretty exciting. And so horses like that, that go for, you know, several, several seven figures are very, very difficult for the average person to be participatory in. So we have the leases, we have ownership, and we also have what we call bundles, which like if you'd like to have maybe 15 or 20 horses for a low price, you can buy into a bundle. So it really the idea would be create the app, give all the information, have all the transparency about what's available, and they'll let the user decide what's best for them. Some people only select California horses. Some people only select one trainer. Some people only pick grass or Philly. You build your own stable the way you want to build it. That's tremendous. I, lo I love that. Yeah, different offerings. And I guess, you know, what you're touching on the seven figures horses brings us to my next question for all of you is like, how do you acquire these? I mean, you're talking about seven figure horses. You've got leases and obviously connections, but Gary, you, you have a connection to Churchill, married to Winstar. There's obviously a, a feeder system there. Michael will touch on in a minute how he sources these horses. But how do you guys get the horses? And, and Gary, is there a particular horse you look for? Is it dirt? Is it turf? I mean, are you looking at two-year-olds? What's the sort of situation as far as your, your, your plan and program with purchasing and acquiring horses? So for us, uh, we wanted to purchase two-year-olds at the sale in April. Okay. Um, so what we tried to do was late February, we opened the offering. Uh, March timeframe and tried to collect as much of the capital as we could. And um, from my standpoint, uh, 
you know, grew up in the game. I, I understand sort of what the trainers go through with these horses. And, and I, I, I put it all on them. I want them to use their bloodstock agent, to use their resources, to use their connections and to pick a horse that they, that they will go to bat for. And they will, you know, they, they will want to live with. And so each one of our trainers have selected uh, the horse that we ended up purchasing. Obviously we give them a budget and a number where we would be comfortable going. Um, and, and we let them do their thing. Those guys are professionals and, and that's what we sort of hire them to do. And, and they're all, all the folks that we used from Wayne Lucas to Brad Cox to Dale Romans to Dallas Stewart. They, they have their game. They, they know this, this drill and, and there's no sense in us trying to change uh, the way they do things. So we, we let them go with the flow and, and pick something out. And like I said, we try to do a two-year-old to just minimize the risk of time and, and expenses uh, as opposed to buying, say, a yearling. But um, ultimately, we're looking in the spring for a two-year-old, and, and we let the trainer sort of pick what they want uh, to, to, to have for them. Right. So you're the, I mean, for the, for the newer owner out there and the novice, I mean, you're the GM, the, the trainer. Right. I'm, I'm putting it in parlance for sports. Now. Yeah. You're the GM. The trainer is the coach, and you're letting him make more of the personnel decisions, right, because he's got to live with that player every day in the situation. You're, you're exactly correct. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we all think we know the game ins and outs, but those are the guys that are up at 4.30 right. every morning that have to see that horse. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was, was go pick one out and, and it doesn't fit Brad Cox's style. You know, Brad has a certain individual that he goes to the sale and he looks for and, and to give him something that doesn't fit his criteria just didn't make sense. So I, I'd rather give, to your point, I'd rather give the coach the ball and let him go figure out who the starting pitcher is. Real quick, how many horses are you managing right now for Churchill Downs Racing Club? Um, like there's, four act, there's four active running right now. We've had as many as 12 or 13 horses that have come through over the course of the last six or seven years. Um, but, you know, as, as the, the time goes on, some have fallen off, some are still racing, some are at the farm. And I think these guys will speak to it too. That's all part of the game. It, you know, it's, it's, we're going to touch on education in a little bit, but that's what it's all about. It's it's, hey, our horse needs 60 days because of this, 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 and this. And, and that's how the game works. And, and we want to be transparent about it. And, and we want the, the, the trainers to, to provide information back to these folks so they can be comfortable in our situation when they do go to a My Race horse or they do go out on their own, that they have some idea of what's going on and they're not just totally in the dark. Mary, what about you, Winston? I mean, you could probably pull that curtain back behind you look out in the paddock and see 500 horses on that farm and just I mean do you yeah. just take your pick how does that work that situation you're exactly right there's a paddock right behind <laughs> here but yeah. uh yeah like as our own bra uh, racing and, and breeding entity uh we're lucky that a lot of the fillies and the, the syndicate are homebreds and you know as I mentioned um the syndicate is all fillies and what's cool about that is the goal behind that is for them to eventually become members of the, the broodmare band here at Windstar. Um, since, you know, it's a top breeding operation. And for that reason, we, we typically seek out really well-bred fillies, whether they be our own or ones we, we purchase at this sale. So I think that gives shareholders some confidence in that they're investing in some quality individuals, and some, some good bloodlines behind them. Um, so yeah, like I said, a lot of them are homebreds, but we've found success with um, some sales purchases as well. As well, Like Gary said, like, you know, we really like the two-year-old sales and we've had some success there. Um, including one of our best fillies, Crystal Ball. She was a two-year-old sale purchase. And, um, you know, there's times we'll go ahead and just throw them into the syndicate right out of a two-year-old sale. And that worked out with us with the um, well, Gulf Coast, who is a filly we purchased out of a two-year-old sale. Um, but yeah, like that's that's just kind of the goal is for them to eventually become bird mares here at the farm. And so we really seek out some, some well-bred fillies and um, whether that be from our own farm or, or at the sales. All right, interesting. So, so far we've got Gary's situation where he's letting the trainer, the coach, pick the horse. Mary's got the in-house personnel at Windstar. They, can, they don't have to source it out. And now, Michael, you were selling mattresses in a box five years ago. How, how do you go from doing that to buying a seven-figure racehorse? Yeah, how, right. Well, I, I, that, that's a good question. So the, the first thing I realized is how much I don't know. So uh, I had to figure out a model that would allow my naivety. Uh, and nascency and horse racing not to get in the way of finding and building a good stable. So what we had developed is a model of partnership. So actually much like how Gary talked about, we wanted to go with the best of the best. People had proven this for years in and years out. So when I first started, what I decided to do was to find people who had proven track records that wanted to get more people involved in ownership and wanted to bring their expertise of picking and maintaining and campaigning 
great horses and allow everyday fans to be able to be participate in that great quality bloodstock. So Spendthrift Farms was one of the first partners that kind of came up and said, we love the concept. We want to get more and more people involved. So I started working with Ned Toffee and that team. I started going out and hiring bloodstock advisors, which are basically specialists that help you pick a horse and started going with people who had unbelievable reputations. And so I put a team, team of, uh, of specialized bloodstock agents, then started soliciting partners that had their own bloodstock agents and had proven success and figured one plus one equals three, right? I've got a team of experts that have been doing this, you know, and had the track record. I partnered with somebody who has a track record and only do we buy the horse if both teams agree. I'm like, every horse is going to be a superstar. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, but it's a good model. It's a good model. So that, that's really how we work is. So right now we have a global bloodstock team. Actually, we have 30 horses in Australia, about 75 here in the U.S. And we're building up our, our UK and Ireland uh, stable as well. And so we have a global bloodstock lead that oversees all the specialists, all our in-house teams and our advisors, and then partners with different organizations in each market that has proven to be successful. And that's, that's how we scale the business for stable acquisitions. That's unbelievable numbers. I didn't realize. So, I mean, you said 30. So you're about 105 on your inventory right now. And I didn't realize you were, you know, spread across the globe. And how has how that scaled up in the last year or so? Or was that the goal from the beginning? Uh, no, I mean, the well, I think it was always the ambition from the beginning. I didn't know how practical the ambition was. Uh, yeah. But the goal was definitely to go global. I, I have We have a hypothesis that we believe that uh, the, the globalization of racing is is going to be here before you know it. I think it's happening more yep. and more. You look at organizations like TVG sharing great races from all across the globe. I think that fans are going to wind up really starting to enjoy racing at a much more global level in the next three to five years at a exponential growth rate. So part of what we want to do was bring the best of Australian racing and Irish racing and French racing, and UK racing, Canadian, US, bring it all together in one platform. And so we started in the US after we had the success in the first couple of years, US, we went down uh, last year and set up Australia. It took us about six months to go through the same securities issues and challenges and deal with regulators. Launched about nine weeks ago there and picked up 3,000 owners in the first nine weeks and bought a nice little stable to give people quality and uh, picked up our first stakes fillies just uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's very, very new, but uh, it seems to be being met with really good energy. Yeah, I know Australia, my little knowledge, I know that you know, multiple ownership ownership groups has been a big thing in Australia, getting people involved for a long time. What about north of the border, Canada? You know, I spent a lot of time up there as far as racing goes. I know getting licensed for owners can be tough across the border. I know it's certainly in that case, the trainers and jockers. Are you going to venture into Canada soon? Yeah, so great question. So I, uh, as much as I love horse racing and thought I got involved and stopped selling mattresses so I could hang out with horses and horse racing. I spend most of my time with lawyers and regulators. Uh, so it's really a terrible gig. People think it's a lot more romantic than it really is, but maybe one Saturday a month, they get to enjoy the fruits of the labor. Uh, Canada regulators are not an easy group to yeah. want getting past right now. It's actually not so much on the racing and licensing side. Uh, we've got some good momentum there, but we have a lot of work we have to do in order to get the regulatory approval to be able to use our app. And we will not go into market until we achieve regulatory compliance. So we're having the same, Canada and, and Ireland right now have the most challenges for us in achieving that regulatory compliance. We're very confident we will. It's just something that a lot of infrastructure has to be developed before you can get that compliance and, and be able to, you know, and really the reason we achieve that is we want to advertise. We want to market. We want to bring lots of people in the game. And we want those people, if they happen to get lucky enough, it is so hard to make money in this game. And you know, in most situations, you're going to wind up probably losing off the basis, just the, the harsh reality of owning a racehorse. You better do it for the enjoyment and the thrills. But in the back of our mind, do we want that $50,000 yearling that turns out to be a group one, grade one winner and reap the benefits? Of course we do. And so part of why we spend so much time is for that one moment, that one moment that your horse really achieves that kind of status and the you know, stud farms, stallion farms start knocking on your door. We want everybody to appreciate the excitement of that thrill as well. So we'll keep moving forward and hopefully in Canada and Ireland over the next three to six months, we'll have a regulatory uh, approval. All right, we'll keep, keep us posted about that situation. Uh, Gary, uh, talk about some of the successes. We haven't heard, we, you know, we've heard about the background, getting into it well, once we're involved. What about some of the successes you've had at Church and House Racing Club? Yeah, so the, the first horse was, was the home run and, and that really kickstarted everything. It was a, a Colt named Warriors Club that we purchased for $50,000 and Wayne Lucas had him and, and he rattled off a few stakes wins, including the Commonwealth Stakes at Keeneland, which is a grade three. 
Um, I think the, the, probably the race that might've helped Michael out a whole lot was the, uh, Spendthrift Stallion Stakes where, um, so B. Wayne Hughes, uh, the, the ever, ever the innovator conjured up the idea of offering a race at Churchill Downs that was only eligible to horses, uh, by Spendthrift Sires. And, uh, and little beknownst to Mr. Hughes, when he came over here on that Saturday afternoon, that Warriors Club, who was by a Spendthrift Stallion named Warriors Reward, would jump up and win his first race in that Spendthrift Stallion race. So here's Mr. Hughes with a big check and about 300 people pouring out onto the Churchill Downs racetrack um, for, for, to accept Mr. Hughes's presentation for the Spendthrift Stallion race. And I, I think at that point in time, Mr. Hughes was hooked on this idea of all these people having so much fun owning horses. So uh, we actually did a partnership similar to him not, not long after that. And I think he really sunk his teeth into it when, when Michael came to him with, with such a great idea. So Warriors Club kickstarted the whole thing off for us. And we've had a few other horses that have gone on their way and won some races. And, um, you know, our, our whole objective is to try to get every horse in the winner's circle, whether it be at Belterra Park or Saratoga or Oaklawn, we want those folks. Uh, we're, we're trying to put horses where we know they can win um, in an effort to, uh, to have somebody that can hang a, a win picture on their wall and tell their grandkids about, you know, what a great day they had uh, as a winning thoroughbred owner, because ultimately that's what it's all about in our game. And that's what really strikes a chord um, with people. So Warriors Club being the biggest success story, um, have had a few other horses that have been allowance winners and a few horses that have competed in stakes races, but but he carried the flag for us. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I, I can attest as someone who's trained horses and owned horses, like it, it doesn't matter what the race is, you know, whether it's a, it's a maiden 20 or a stakes race, but the feeling is the same. And I think you give your, your investors, you know, I, I always tell people it's like owning a piece of your sports franchise. You know, you, you got these big owning an NFL team, a hockey team, pay billions of dollars. They get to put their name on it and use and watch the colors of the team. Okay, you know, you have one set of silks, but that, that's what it feels like. You're, you're part of a sports franchise. You get your own sports franchise. You can go to the training camp, which is on the backside, see behind the scenes, access not everybody gets. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's really good. Mary, um, what, what are some of the highlights for you as far as the horses have been over the years at Windstar Stable Mates? And, and what number, what's your current roster right now of horses, number wise? So we have um, nine Phillies running right now. And, you know, as we've discussed, you know, things can happen with horses um, yeah. throughout the year. Um, and so even if, you know, we kind of started with 10 fillies going in, but we'll, you know, add fillies as needed if, if we're capable of doing so. Like, um, like I mentioned, we added Gulf Coast when she was a two-year-old out of the sale and, and put her in. So right now we're going with um, nine fillies. And I would say definitely our, our biggest achievement to date uh, was we were really lucky to run one, two in last year's coaching club, American Oaks at Saratoga and um, parasites and crystal ball finished just a, within a head of each other at the wire there last year, which is, um, I think many of our members would agree the biggest thrill we've had so far. And we've been really fortunate to have continued success with both of those Phillies, um, parasites won the grade three distaff handicap earlier this year. Crystal Ball won the $250,000 um, Lady Jacqueline stakes. And, you know, we're, we're seeking out some more stakes races with both of those fillies. Um, actually, our first ever win as a syndicate um, was in the 2018 Wayward Last Stakes with Well Humor. So they started off with the stakes win, uh, which is pretty special. But as Gary said, it's, it's not just races like that. We try to place our horses in spots where they're going to win because, you know, members love um, seeing their horses cross the wire first. So like you said, whether it's running at Belterra or Indiana Grand or, uh, you know, wherever they fit, we try to, we try to run them there. And I think our, our stats have really kind of backed that up and we're, we're pretty proud of those this year. We're, we're winning at a 33% clip. We're 75% in the money in 2021 and the syndicate's only been around since 2018 and, and we have a 55% in the money percentage. So, um, we're pretty proud of that. And, you know, we're, we're just continuing and hoping to continue to have that success. That's tremendous. Yeah, I think, look, having trained, and I, I think, you know, placing horses is key, no matter what level you're at, is putting the horses in the right spot to compete. I, I think that's absolutely vital. And 32 win percent strike rate is, is, is very good. I mean, if, you, if you're listening at home, anything over 20% is considered elite. So that's outstanding. Uh, Michael, I think I'm going to know the answer to some of the success stories you've had with horses in a short period of time. I mean, is there anything left? Should you just wrap this thing up and be done with it? You won the Kentucky Derby, right? 
That's, that's why I went down to Australia. I want the Melbourne Cup now. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we, we got uh, incredibly lucky and, and blessed to have the partnership with Authentic. Obviously, that's the big horse. And I remember when Ned Toffee and Eric and, and Wayne came to me about the idea and about, you know, making a play and going after it. And Ned was convinced this was the into mischief that was going to prove he can get the classic distances and, uh, you know, such a freak on the track. And uh, so got involved and you know, you can get involved late. We didn't, we didn't buy him as a yearling. We bought him as a winner already. So this isn't one, this is one, like I wasn't putting hands on horses and pick the horse and take all the credit. We bought this horse after he had already proven to be successful, but even that it's not easy to, to, to pick the horse that's going to continue to go. And we got lucky enough that he was as, as excited and, and, uh, and athletic and, you know, successful on the track as we hoped he would be. So winning that Derby was incredible. Then going on to win the Brewers cup classic. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll be chasing that feeling for the rest of our careers, I'm sure. And I'm always going to, you know, 10 years from now, we have the nostalgia of looking back. Hopefully there's others in the, uh, in, in, in the history books that will be written in the future. Uh, but that was the big one. But, you know, it's so funny. Like, I, I love hearing the stories about it. it really doesn't matter kind of where the track is at, what the state conditions are, because it's so true. I mean, that Kentucky Derby was an amazing experience for over 5,000 people. And I got calls and videos of tears and a guy jumping in a pool. And I mean, the, the stories and the social media stuff about what happened when Authentic won was incredible. Now you have 5,000 people that have a personalized winter circle picture in their homes about, you know, that, that's something that is extremely, extremely rare. And now he's standing for 75,000 and they're participating in that, which is great. But I, I spent three, eight, four hours at the track that night, did interviews and all that kind of stuff. And kind of felt like it was out of body experience and, you know, talking to the press and going to all the, the parties and everything and getting, I don't know, 400 texts, more texts than I've got in my entire life. Um, but I'm driving home and we have a horse run at Del Mar. Uh, and it's, I think it's a non-win ra uh, one race and he wins and people go freaking nuts because they had the horse since a year lane. Uh, and the, the joy and the energy on that cohort of people it almost matched the same as authentic. So it doesn't, you follow this horse from the very beginning, you go through all the trials and tribulations of, of that great first breeze where you're so excited. Then all of a sudden the horse gets 30 or 45 days or 60 days turned out. And all of a sudden you think the world's about to end. The horse breaks terrible and runs dead last after dirt in the face. And you think the horse can never run. He surprises you and wins by four at 12 to one. I mean, that journey, if you go on the entire journey, you become so vested, you become so emotional. You've seen everything. You've seen every workout. You've heard every exercise rider update, every trainer insight. And so when that horse does finally get out there and win a race, it's such a thrill regardless of where it's at. So we've had a lot of success, luckily, but I, I swear the joys on the continuum seem to be all over the place in terms of where, where people have really been so passionate about kind of the, the, their horses. Uh, that was tremendous. Yeah, I felt that when I was training, it was always great to develop a horse rather than you know, it was nice for an owner to go buy one and put one in your barn that's won five races. But from, you know, an emotional standpoint and an investment of time and soul investment, you know, developing a horse from a yearling to win a race is, is, is gratifying. OK, so we've been on this journey. We've, you know, we've we've bought in. We've seen the horse training. We've got to the races. We've won a race, two, three races, stakes race. And now we're at the end of the journey. What happens? And, th and this is a subject that is it's very dear to me, thoroughbred aftercare. What do we do at the end of this cycle? You mentioned, several of you mentioned that horses go to sales and go on to you know, new homes, whether it's being a, a breeding horse or, you know, going on to us elsewhere. But there is a certain element of horses that are not going to make it. And I think it's been a hot button issue the thoroughbred aftercare. Full disclosure, I'm so, uh, that's but I think what happened after life of a racehorse is actually more important than what goes on during and before it. Gary, what's your thoughts on thoroughbred aftercare and does the Church of Downs Racing Club have a plan for aftercare? Yeah, you're exactly right. Every every horse we, we run uh, has the intention of, of being retired safely. Um, just to rattle off a few, uh, we retired Warriors Club to the TRF Foundation. He's now at uh, their Blackburn uh, uh, prison facility in Lexington. So He's part of a second chances program that the Third Bed Racing or Third Bed Retirement Foundation um, does to, to give those folks an opportunity to work with horses and then places the, those folks in jobs at racetracks. Um, afterwards, uh, we've claimed horses back. We've uh, bought privately. Um, every horse that's done racing, that was a Church of Downs Racing Club horse, is, is in our, our sites. We're in communication. We've, we've sent to, to homes where people want to retrain, rehome, rehab. 
we've worked with some of the some of the great outstanding programs like Second Stride and the TAA and the, the TRF to make sure that all these horses have great homes. I think it's incredibly important that you know all the fun, all the hoopla, all that stuff is you know is is what it is. But at the end of the day, these horses need to have a great home, and and that whenever you go to buy a horse, you need to have that plan too. Um, the the plan of who trains him, where he's going to run, all those things are are great, but uh, the, the final plan, ha you know, the, the ending has to be written to uh, well in advance, whether it's saving money out of your earnings or, or carving out a percentage. You know, we have a little bit of a slush fund that, that we've accumulated to do just that. There's a horse, as an example, at Indiana Grand right now that was claimed from us for, for $12,500. I've reached out to the trainer two or three times, checking in, how's he doing, what's going on. I've made an offer to purchase the horse. So we're constantly in communication and following along with the Church of Downs Racing Club horses uh, that have left our stable or, or at a time when they need to be retired and making sure they go to the absolute best place we can put them. Say to you, Mary, if somebody signs on with Windstar Stablemates and their first question, this is all well and good, what, what's the end plan? What would your response be? Right. Yeah. So I personally am also very passionate about aftercare. I volunteered for an aftercare facility all through from middle school through college. So it's really important to me. Um, as I mentioned, what's really great about Stablemates is the goal for all these fillies is for them to join our, our broodmare band. Um, so I would say every filly that has not been claimed from us has retired to one star. And I actually keep um, our members posted on them throughout their broodmare career. They get to see the full photos of all the foals that they have. Um, I actually keep a spreadsheet for them to be able to track those foals and everything um, from those fillies that ran previously. Um, you know, as Gary mentioned, you know, these horses do get claimed off of you. That's that's part of the game. And, um, you know, I do my best to try to keep track of them. And what's really great is our members are really passionate about that as well. And, um, you know, they still follow all of those fillies and, and we reach out and, you know, let them know that there is, you know, a home for them when they're done racing. If, if they need one, if they're not secured one from who they're with at that moment. But um, I would say a, a large majority of the fillies um have retired here to winstar and the only ones that haven't are, were ones that were claimed from us and um you know winstar itself um donates to all sorts of thoroughbred aftercare facilities and is a proud sponsor of the retired racehorse project so aftercare is, is near and dear to to the farm as a whole and uh, certainly to stable mates and mike i mean you're dealing with obviously larger scale over 100 horses it's, it's a, a big task for you globally and i know certain racetracks some some are kind of playing taking a small fee out of the purse money to take care of this situation after care what are your views on it or do you set aside some dollars in that initial investment from an equity shareholder for aftercare yeah no it's 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 super important um obviously with the stable that we've had we've already had you know dozens of horses that have been retired and we've had to kind of you know help steward that through um and i would say that there's two parts of it for us so one is that for every share you buy online we work to deal out with the taa to basically make a donation there to make sure that we were continuing yep. to fund them they do amazing work accrediting i can't you know, kind of stay abreast of all the different organizations across the United States and who's accredited and who's a good home. And there's a lot of people that are well-meaning that maybe don't have the actual infrastructure or the ability to take care of an animal for so long. So there's a difference between well-meaning and some a, a safe place to be able to send your horse. So that delineation is important to us that we want both well-meaning and they have the infrastructure and the proven kind of credentials to, 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 to care for the horse, which is why we make the donation to TAA. And then on top of that, we use our platform to be able to raise money for different organizations. I mean, we have tens of thousands of people that as we educate them about aftercare, they get extremely passionate about it. So we've had a lot of different fun kind of promotions that we've been able to do to kind of curate our members, take advantage of our platform and our, our, our size. So for instance, when Authentic was in the Brewers Cup, Brewers Cup donated an extra set, a set of tickets. Um, so we had 5,314 members. We only had 38 tickets. Uh, so we had a lottery. That's how we got that. We did actually, Johnny V went into, to click a wheel and he pulled out 38 names and that's who got to go to the, the, the Brewers Cup. And it was really fun. We did a Facebook live for it. Uh, but we also had two extra tickets that the Brewers Cup gave us. And then we auctioned them off to charity and we raised over $10,000 for two tickets, which was wow. amazing. Uh, we did the same thing for Preakness. We'll have lottery badges to go into the lottery and see your house and uh, see your horse. And we'll have had people raise hundreds of dollars there. So we've done we've done a, a pretty good job using the platform to be able to do different charity events and raising money 
Uh, and we also have a fund that we keep separate. We've had the same, we also have a right of first refusal in all of our partnership agreements. So if a horse winds up getting sold to a place in which we feel like we're gonna lose control, uh, we have the right to exercise the ability to buy that partner out. So we had a horse actually that won back-to-back -back races, um, but continued was facing ankle issues. So instead of having a private sold and go somewhere we weren't able to keep tabs on him, we decided to uh, retire him. And then we worked with uh, Racing for Home, uh, Acacia's company, and she helped us find a great place in Coachella uh, area that he now is kind of going through the whole, you know, retrain process and figuring out if he can jump. And he's not a very good jumper, but he's working on it and he's happy. And so uh, we also work with uh, New Vocations and Karma. So it's a very big part. I, I didn't realize, to be honest, how much it was going to take of our time was to really commit to this. But I'll tell you this, some of our most exciting app updates are our uh, owner updates on our retired horses. We have this one horse who just would not run. He, he did not like racing. He just decided to, I'm not going to race, but he loves this kind of retraining to, 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 to get into jumping. Uh, and following that career, it, it literally brings tears to your eyes when you see this horse kind of just flourishing and thriving in his second career. So very important part. I don't think anybody should get into ownership that isn't committed financially and emotionally to take care of these horses. They race for what, three years and they live for 25. We have a much bigger responsibility than taking care of them just on the track. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, at the TAA, look, you said it, we, we accredit all the um, facilities across, and it's a high accreditation process, believe me. We just, just don't hand out specifically. It's, it's, it's the extensive search and, and look at the property. So uh, I would agree with you that. And, and to Gary's point, I think you've got to script the end at the beginning. So you, you don't wait till the horse's career is over and then think about it. You have a plan in place beforehand, and all three of you certainly do. Okay. So you've got all these owners coming in, they get a taste of success for two or three years. Now, maybe they want to go on their own or go out, you know, from a, from a hundred dollar micro share, a $500 share. Now they don't want, they want to own 25% of a horse, 50% of a horse that they're bringing their own friends in. Have you seen an uptick in that? Does that happen? Uh, are there any success stories like that? And, you know, I'll just throw this in there. Have you seen an uptick? Because here at TVG, you know, we've seen it during COVID, there was no other sports. Horse racing was the only entity. We saw a huge uptick in, 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 in customers and people wanted to get involved that had never been involved. You know, I'm talking about people that have been involved in sports for 30, 40 years. And all of a sudden they jump over to horse racing. Have you seen new ownership groups getting in Gary? And have you seen some of your owners depart and go on to do bigger, different things, better things, worse things, or do they stay with you? No, uh, our sole focus was to sort of be the launching pad for these folks to, that were always interested in owning a horse, but didn't know where, where to write a $25,000 check or whatever. So our goal at Churchill Downs was to introduce them to the game and let them launch themselves into bigger and better things at whatever level of the game they want to play. Absolutely. In, in my perspective, the most rewarding thing that we've done with the racing club is, is there's well over a hundred new owners that have gone on that had never owned a horse before that joined the racing club and then went out and made the next step in some form or fashion. Uh, there's a group of six guys that got together and, and they befriended each other and they've claimed a couple of $7,500 horses and they're doing their thing. Uh, we have countless people that have joined my racehorse and Winstar Stablemates. Um, so, so those folks have gone on to take that next step. We have two or three people that jumped into a little bit of deeper into the pool. They had more means to, to spend money and, and they were doctors or lawyers or whatever. And, were unsure, but, but trusted Churchill Downs and trusted me and trusted our trainers and, and kind of built that rapport. We're able to build that rapport up with folks through the racing club that sprung for 50 or $60,000 out of sale just to, to kind of do their own thing their own way. So our folks have sort of run the gamut in ownership uh, after joining the racing club. And, and the fact that a hundred people or a hundred plus people now, after a few more years have, uh, I've entered the game after having never been involved is, is absolutely the most rewarding thing. And, and again, our mission with the Church of Downs Racing Club is to just provide the, the door and the entry point, let them see it, feel it, uh, taste success, and then find, find what way works for them to, to kind of continue on their journey. Mary, same question for you. Have you seen people, a core group stay with you, or have you seen somebody branch out and do their own thing and uh, had success elsewhere? Yeah, definitely both. And, um, you know, going off what Gary said, that's, that's our goal from the get-go is to create new owners. Even when Stablemates first started and was just a fan initiative to educate um, these people on the industry and, and everything behind the scenes, 
that's been the goal is to prepare them for things like this. And so, you know, obviously Stablemates has given them that opportunity to explore racehorse ownership. And we've had several kind of go out on their own, uh, whether, you know, there's been some that have, have stayed in on Stablemates and pursued their own endeavors or who have said, okay, well, this is a great opportunity for me to, to get a start in this venture. I'm going to go out on my own. And, you know, we've had people go out and purchase um, their own racehorses or kind of get involved even on the breeding side of things, make some breeding investments. Um, actually, one of our members right now, she purchased a broodmare last year. She had her first foal by that mare this year, or out of that mare this wow. year, and she's going to continue breeding her mare and seeing where that takes her. She still has a foal as well, so it's really, really exciting to see that. Um, you know, as Gary said, we also have a lot of members who have joined my racehorse, West Point, different partnerships like that. They really kind of you know, try to spread out their their opportunities within racehorse ownership. And I think that's really exciting for them to get to see um, different ways that it's done and, and different opportunities with end, industry. And then hopefully that can lead to their own forms of ownership down the road. Yeah, that's great. That's, it, it's, it's a starter point. That's what we're garnering from, from this conversation. It's a starter point. It's an entree into horse racing. Michael, could, I mean, could there be a situation in about five years where you created the next B. Wayne Hughes and you're calling him up as a partner with Oars, somebody that formerly owned a hundred dollar micro share in your company? I've, I've, well, not quite to the B. Wayne Hughes level, but I have no <laughs> doubt that this is becoming a uh, breeding ground, pun intended, uh, for a next generation of ownership. Uh, the, 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 the biggest incorrect assumption that people make around my racehorse is because we have these low minimums that it's some kind of socioeconomic play. Uh, the reality is this is an accessibility play. Just because you open up an E-Trade account and you buy, you can buy a share of Apple for $132 for a company that's valued at $2 trillion, that doesn't say anything about your one socioeconomic kind of situation. It's just a simplicity of accessibility. I download the E-Trade account, I find the stocks that I'm interested, I begin in investing, start learning. And then as a more and more confident, I come in and make bigger investments. So the idea was that you have trial. And so I know that's true because once we basically launched very, very quickly, we had people, I had my first text was somebody who called me and said, or texted me and said, Hey, I'm in this race. I'm like, I know you are because we're in the race. He's like, no, no, I'm against you. Uh, and I looked down and he had, he had claimed a horse and he was running against me in the race. So I thought that was, that was kind of my first experience and aha moment that it began and then we, we just saw every, I mean, literally every week, somebody will email in, I want to take it to the next level. I want to take it to the next level. What do I do? So we actually, so my racehorse actually has a traditional partnership product as well called edge racing. And so edge racing is minimum five or 10% to get in horses. The average you know purchase price is 10 to $15,000. You are responsible for all your bills. You've got to pay that. And we launched that just a few months ago and we're already up to 10 horses. Um, we already we actually were just in the dueling grounds, ran second in the $750,000 dueling grounds with one of our horses there. And we brought in it, it, every single one started with a micro share. Everyone started off spending a hundred dollars on a racehorse. And now they're in for, you know, some people up to six figures and they're in their traditional partnership. And I have no doubt that their next progression will be the same thing. They'll go to the sales. Eventually they'll find their blood stock agent and they'll be buying. So I think it's a very natural progression. A lot of people stay within my racehorse slash edge because they've, they've come to really, you know, learn the bloodstock team, the process, the transparency. They just want more skin in the game. They want that owner's license. My racehorse doesn't allow you to get your owner's license with a My Racehorse share. So you have to have a certain kind of overall percentage. So when you go into edge, you have that ability. And so, you know, I, I think it is, again, it's 10 horses. It's over hundred members already part of that group. So I think proof is in the pudding, the fact that edge was able to launch so quickly. It's, I love the progression. Pretty, I mean, I say, yeah, I love the progression. Go ahead, Gary. I say it's, it's funny too, because um, no one wants the next horse to be the really good one. So <laughs> once you get them in, they're in, they're in and they're in. Um, no one wants to, to stop at club three and club four's horse be, you know, the, the grade one winner. So right. even in my world with, you know, a not-for-profit setting, we have people in five or six different clubs just because they're passionate about horse racing. They love uh, the experience that they get. And, and I'm sure Michael and Mary uh, have seen this too. They just want to be involved and they want to, and they want to have that ability to say my horse is racing on Saturday at such and such racetrack. And it, it is really funny watching them. Uh, should I buy this one? And then they, they ultimately decide, man, I don't want this one to be the good one. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and look, you, you guys, I mean, you've, I'm sure you've increased attendance at racetracks. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm there. I'm at the races every day. I watch more races than anyone on a calendar year. 
And between attendance, I've seen at Del Mar, you've had your lounge up there, the My Racehorse Lounge. Gary, you talked about your winner's circle pictures. Uh, Mary, I'm sure that's the same situation. Between attendance and handle, I mean, these racetracks got to be happy. And let me tell you, the handle is effective because every time one of your guys' horses is running, the odds, 20 minutes apart, I mean, they just drop like that. And it's everybody with their $10, $10, and it just feeds on itself. I mean, you've got to get great feedback from the tracks, right? Parimutually and from an attendance standpoint, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. And especially some of the smaller tracks. I mean, when we when we go to Indiana Grand, for example, and we take 75 people they you know, they all first and foremost, all of the tracks are incredibly receptive to your point of, of what we're doing, and want to open their doors and want to make sure they can accommodate as many people in the paddock as possible, and make sure that that accommodations are made because I think they see to, to your exact point, the value and what all of our organizations can bring to the table. You know, it's hard to quantify exactly what uh, handle would have been with or without our horse but you know you can certainly you'd be foolish to not think we're making some sort of impact on both coke oh, sales you are. handle <laughs> and, and the dining room reservations and everything in between and and track photographers love us too very same question for you i mean um, how, what's your average attendance let's let's ask you that what's your average attendance when one of these horses run it really just varies um, and kind of depends on what sort of race we're in. But like this year, we had Paris Lights run on the Kentucky Oaks undercard. So we had a full suite at the Jockey Club Suites at Churchill Downs. So, you know, we had about almost 30 people there. And uh, yeah, like, like Gary said, they track photographers definitely love us. And like you said, I think it's actually one of the favorite jokes among, among our members is watching the odds drop on our fillies. And, you know, they'll kind of have a uh, discussion amongst each other about like okay who's responsible for this sudden like odds job like how much money did you put down on her things like that so without a doubt I think we're absolutely contributing um, to handle and what's really fun is when they do get together at our races um, is they just have such a, a great um, camaraderie, camaraderie among them and they love to kind of compete against each other go in on pick fives pick sixes like they just make a whole day of it while they're at the track and I would say they're also very um, vocal about when our horses are running. They like to post on social media, you know, about the, what race they're running in, what track they're running at. And I think that really brings further exposure to those racetracks, uh, which is always something uh, that those, those tracks are, are grateful for. And obviously we're grateful to those tracks for hosting us. They always do their best to accommodate us no matter what the situation is. And, you know, so I think it, it's beneficial to us and it's beneficial to the tracks as well. Yeah, and Michael, for you, you've invested in marketing dollars as well around racetracks, we see. So they've got to be receptive for that and the people you bring to the track, right? Definitely. Uh, I think receptive is, is, is definitely a correct word. I think, though, there is still challenges ahead. Um, I think that we, this isn't just like uh, everything's going perfect and no problem the track. We're all ready to accept 7,000 people owning a racehorse and they figure out how to handle winter circle and paddock and tickets and uh, licensing. There's some challenges ahead on this one. This is a real issue, I think. I think it's a good issue to have that we have kind of this increased amount of strain on given capacity, but we've had to do marketing partnerships. We've had to buy you know, a bunch of pre-hospitality because we the tracks can't support our owners all the time on big race days. Um, so I, I think the tracks have been definitely, definitely have taken us very seriously, have a, a spirit of collaboration. How do we figure this out? But by no means are we there yet, right? I don't think that US racing was ready. I mean, we have one horse that has 7,000 owners in it. Um, there's just a lot of challenges that come with that. So as much as I think we've made a lot of progress and the, and the tracks love the handle, like you said, the horses are consistently open up at four to five, six to five, seven, it's ridiculous, yeah. right? Luckily, I, I know there's a lot of debate on, on, the, on, on the, the value and integrity of computer bed and all that stuff. For me, it works out great because they come in at the end, they kind of normalize the odds so things work out okay. So at least my, my, my owners aren't getting anything like, uh, much below fair market value. But I would just say, as, as, as we all think about just micro show ownership and mass syndication and what it means to get tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pe uh, people involved in ownership, I think it's going to put some pressure on tracks. I think it's going to put pressure on existing infrastructure and licensing and, and a lot of other things. And I don't, I don't think it all comes with, uh, it's all kind of roses and, and fairy tale and rainbows. There's some real challenges that are on the horizon. I think with the scale that organizations like us are bringing to ownership and racing. 
I actually Thank really agree with that. I think there's a lot of room uh, for improvement for, you know, tracks are doing a great job, but these partnerships are ever growing and they're just going to continue to be more and more. So as far as licensing, accommodations, things like that, um, there's definitely room to grow to allow these people to, to get the access that they're, they're signing up for. You know, they're, they're doing what they can, but I, I agree. I think it, it's definitely a path we need to continue down. Absolutely. Don't get me started on licensing. That, we could spend here an hour here on this. Wow, well, that, that needs rearranging. Anyway, all right, we're coming to the end of our panel discussion. Then we'll move into the Q&A set portion because we've been going, let me check the clock, well over an hour. You guys have been great, solid information, great answers to the questions and a lot of advice for everybody watching out there. So I'll conclude with this last question. If anybody is sitting out there watching or listening, I'm gonna go back and listen to this recording. What's the one piece of advice I'll start with you, Gary, we'll go around the horn again, that you would give to anybody that wants to invest in a racing club or a micro share investment. What would you tell them? Just one piece of advice. I think it's go into it with an open mind and, and make it about having fun um, and, and make it about wanting to learn. That's ultimately, you, if you go into to this with the idea that you're going to crush it or you're going to have a grade one winner or you're going to make a fortune, it just doesn't work that way. Um, I think my, my one bit of advice would just be to, to go into it looking for something to have fun with and a new passion to take on and something new to experience. So um, that would be that'd be it for me. Mary? Honestly, the same thing for me, go into it looking for, for the experience. It's what it's all about is to kind of um, get in there and, and see what racehorse ownership is all about and understand that true racehorse ownership is a big risk um financially in all in all sorts of ways so these clubs and these partnerships and micro shares really allow you to go in there with a lowered risk and i think it's also as we touched on earlier a really great way to to get started from an educational standpoint because by being in these partnerships you're having someone kind of guide you through it and educate you and help you understand the decisions that are made for the horses and what races you're going in and things like that that'll help prepare you for if you do choose to further go down that path and then also just kind of be open to um, joining a group of like-minded people who have the, the shared interests that you do and um, just really have some fun with it. Same question to you, Michael. Uh, I mean, I think both are, are, are super sound. I would say the only thing I would add on top of that is diversify. Uh, this game is so hard. Finding a fast racehorse, unfortunately, I don't care how much diligence you do. I don't care how well-bred they are. I don't care how good the connections and the trainers and the vets and the assistant trainers are. Most ho horses run slower than you want them to. Um, so the reality is, if you really want to go into it, diversify. If you want to spend $1,000 on one horse, spend 800 across six horses and get involved, get to know different connections, get to know different racetracks. Uh, one thing I like so much about kind of the, the My Racehorse platform right now is we keep lowering those minimums and we have a whole diversity of trainers. I think there's over 18 different trainers in the, in, the, in the stable right now. So to get to know how different trainers work on different horses, how they use workouts, how they use the condition book, kind of how they think and they approach different races, how they pick their jockeys. I think the whole part of it is amazing. I think there's so many nuances and so much insight that can be garnered from each one of these barns. They're so uniquely different. I think sometimes we make it a little bit ubiquitous, but maybe commoditize the fact that it's like kind of there's one process to kind of train a horse and bring him to the races. The reality is there's so many nuances and differences each of these stables and barns bring. And they're really beautiful, like not to be overly romantic, but they are, they're very specific. They bring great horsemanship and different approaches and different styles. And if you can go in and you can get to know a ton of different ones, you will find one that you like better. And maybe that's when you then kind of go on your own a little bit, or you go into a partnership that focuses on that specific trainer, that connection, or maybe you like Phillies better than Colts. You like the, you know, claiming game better than this. I would diversify, try a lot before you get too aggressive. That concludes our panel discussion. What's, what's some great advice? I mean, that really was tremendous advice from all three of you. We thank you for your time. We're going to head into the, to the Q and a period right now. So, while we sort through the questions, uh, Gary's going to be the moderator of those questions. I just want you to listen to a quick word from our Q&A sponsor, Blood Horse. Blood Horse Plus, available through bloodhorse.com, provides exclusive, timely, and unmatched content to subscribers, including Fox Sports, Blood Horse branded weekly programs, a detailed stakes winners section, behind the scenes videos from Blood Horse staff, on demand access to deeper horse statistics, and a $5 monthly credit to equineline.com. Upgrade to Blood Horse Plus today. 
All right, Gary's been sorting through the questions. I'm sure we've got a lot coming in, Gary. Uh, take it away. Okay, yeah, thanks, Simon. And thanks to the panelists. Great insight on this topic. Uh, so let's get started with questions. Here's one. How do you communicate with your members and how often? So let's, uh, why don't we start with Gary Palmasano. Gary, how do you guys communicate with your members? Well, I, I think all of us are in the same boat here. Social media has been a huge advantage to us. The ability to take a video camera or a cell phone back there and, and get words from Wayne Lucas on, on how a horse is training or to pop up a workout video. Um, those types of resources have allowed us to connect with people on a far greater scale and with much more ease. So for us, it's a, a Facebook group that the Church of Downs Racing Club has that has pictures and videos and interviews with jockeys and interviews with trainers um, that kind of keep people abreast of what's going on. And then it's an email database. We try to get out at least something once every couple of weeks or whenever there's news or an upcoming race or a change of plans. Um, we try to email that individual, uh, you know, group member um, about their particular horse. But but for, for so with, with the advantages of social media, uh, and I'm sure Michael and Mary's teams do a whole lot more than we do. But but that's that's the, the way sort of to to do this easier to the masses, I guess. Michael or Mary, you need you like to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I try to keep them in the loop with everything that's going on with the entire roster of Phillies. So every Friday I send out a full um, roster update on every single one of the horses. Um, you know, like Gary said, social media has been great and just the technology that we have now. We also have a group through the app called Slack, which is really great for just quick little updates or tidbits, um, little photos or videos we may have. Um, I will say our, our trainers are really great about communication as well. We have several fillies with Rudolph Brissett, who, um, you know, we're really fortunate. He's just down the road from the farm at Keeneland. Um, so I'm able to get videos of the fillies under his care frequently, as well as the ones here on the farm. And he's really great. And he'll sit down with me once a week to do an audio update for all the fillies that he trains in the syndicate. So they get that every week as well. And just as things um, come up, whether that be a race entry or a breeze video, things like that, that's sent out, that's sent out pretty much that day. So they're kept constantly in the loop. So for us, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a lot. So we have a team, we have a racing management and content team in every major market uh, that spends their mornings uh, at the tracks and going to the stables and interviewing the trainers and getting content and videos. And, you know, we have to buy our own equipment in some situations because some places there's nowhere to get the workout videos and, and we have to basically do it ourselves. So there's definitely a lot of infrastructure challenges in the States at some of the tracks in getting uh, like workout videos, for instance, right? So you have to kind of send your team down there. That's a huge part of wanting to see your horse progress. Uh, so it's a difference. It's between staff. Uh, then we have the My Race Horse app that pushes you a notification anytime there's an update. Um, and I think in terms of frequency, it really depends on the trainer. Like some trainers are very aggressive. They give us tons of content. They're always giving us insights. They join our, our live videos and TV shows and they do Q&A and answer questions. Others are not as participatory. They're maybe great mm -hmm. horsemen or, but they're just not gonna spend as much time with the ownership group. So it really depends. Like we try to bring is we try to maximize the amount of content you can get from every ownership, uh, from every training kind of team, but not everyone is the same. And that's again, goes back to diversification is that you will have different experiences on the richness of content and the frequency of content predicated on what trainers you're with. I, I think Michael makes a good point to expand on it. And it's, it's two way communication for probably all of our groups. You know, we, we certainly put out a lot of information, but the amount of questions um, and emails and, and, hey, why did your trainer do this, this or this? Or, you know, people want to learn. People want to second guess, <laughs> but, but people want to learn, too. And so there's a lot of two way back and forth communication with with members that just want to learn or, or, hey, you know, I, I saw our horses in on the turf today. You know, why why did somebody or why did your trainer decide to do that? And like our Facebook group, for example, you know, one of our trainers, Tommy Drury, he loves to get on there and answer questions uh, that people may have and invite other folks to ask questions because, you know, that that's what, what we're here for is to to have these people that that may have a question. It's really hard to go ask, you know, to try to get inside of Todd Pletcher's brain. But all of us as the mediators can kind of respond back to, to what Tommy Drury or what Todd Pletcher or, or what they're thinking and why they're doing it and sort of lean on our own expertise and our own teams to sort of be that middleman to to answer a lot of questions and in turn share more information because, you know, sure, we push out a lot of content, but we, I personally, and I'm sure these guys do too, 
get by far more questions back from people wanting to learn and want to understand. Okay. So here's a question about COVID. How has COVID affected your business in either a positive way or a negative way? Uh, I can start with that. Uh, so when COVID kicked in, in the first couple of weeks, I remember calling my uh, investors that helped me fund this crazy idea. And I said, we're screwed. I said, the business has completely stopped. No one's going to buy a racehorse with everything that's going on right now. The stock market was crashing and people were getting laid off. I mean, it was a very significant and dire situation. And racehorse ownership was at way, way you know, below any priority level that even was going to get any mind share. Um, but as the, the markets rebounded, as the, basically we started to get a little more of clarity in terms of how we were going to deal with the pandemic, you very saw the consumer now kind of yearning for an escape. They're looking for a mental escape from everything that was going on. And we were blessed enough to be in, a, in an environment that didn't stop. We were able to navigate as a sport, as an industry, kind of COVID and keeping most of our racing going. And we absolutely were the beneficiaries of that because it was one of the places that you could go to escape. And I heard that word escape, distraction, uh, a moment of joy throughout my day. I mean, I don't know how many times we heard that. So it proved, I thought it was going to be the end of the business, business honestly. And it truly be, it came, became the catalyst to prove out that this is really interesting and significant and people are really enjoying it. So uh, it was kind of the tale of two, 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 two halves for me. I would agree that, you know, there were both positive and negative effects. We certainly, um, so since we operate on a, on a year to year calendar lease of the Phillies, you know, people came into this year and they weren't sure that they wanted to renew because coming into 2021, we really didn't know what things were going to look like. We didn't know if you were going to be able to um, travel, to go to races, to go to events. We have events at the farms for members too. Um, so we actually did, we kind of extended our, um, sign up deadline as things kind of progressed a bit and we had people go ahead and say, okay, I will, I will do this. And I'm, I think they're glad that they did because we were able to have some really great days at the track this year with, with all of us together. Um, and then there were people like Michael said that really saw it as a form of escapism and it was their way to enjoy something that they truly love while they're, they're stuck at home. Like, you know, we have some people who have autoimmune diseases or other um, pre-existing um, conditions that keep them from really being able to go out and do much um, during the pandemic. So being able to follow these sources has really been uh, an important thing to, to, to provide them something positive to keep up with during these times. Okay. Uh, here's the next question. Is there a typical demographic of the micro share or racing club owners? For example, are they gamblers? Are they regular track attendees? Etc. So, what type of demographic do you all uh, see that you attract as members? Uh, so, we do a, a decent amount of work on this, uh, trying to understand it. Uh, and as it, you can imagine, uh, it it really spans the entire gamut. Uh, we definitely have people who have grown up in the races their entire lives and never had the means to be able to participate in, in racehorse ownership. So, it was pent up demand, and they kind of got involved, which was great. Um, but we also have people who had no clue racehorse ownership was even a possibility. I mean, I always give the example, go down to any major city, go down to kind of a, a, a row of doctors and lawyers in a kind of commercial building, ask how many of those would know how to get started in racehorse ownership. You know, in our little ecosystem, in our kind of world, we kind of think that we've kind of, hey, the partnerships, we've all kind of gotten out there. It's pretty easy to get involved. There's lots of different places to go. If you go ask people who watch the races very passively, see it as, kind of big Saturdays, Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cups, and watch it kind of on a very kind of passive way. They enjoy it, but they're just not all in. They have no clue how to get started. Because of that, I think our demographics look like a traditional mainstream demographics. We have, you know, affluency is all over the place, you know, race, gender, age, it's all over the place. Um, and I think it really just predicated on the fact that we're touching so many new people with the way that we promote the product. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> we're, we're in the same boat, ultimately. I, I think we went into this thing with a preconceived notion that $500 was going to draw a particular person, and, and that's just totally not what happened. Um, we had general race fans. We had high, high dollar earners. We had people who just, um, you know, wanted something fun to do and, and wanted to be able to, to be more social and, and take on a new passion or new hobby. So 
as Michael said, we're, we're across the board. I would say we're pretty across the board too, but um, since Stablemates did start out as kind of a fan club behind an all exclusive look into Winstar, a lot of them stayed on um, since that fan club started. So it's, you know, a lot of horse lovers, horse racing fans and, you know, people who enjoy gambling, but we've, you know, we've certainly had people um, who have just decided, hey, this is a good opportunity opportunity to see what racing is all about. And I would say, you know, a lot of people um, in central Kentucky and kind of the Ohio River Valley area um, have really enjoyed um, joining the program because so many of our horses are based in Kentucky and obviously we have the farm and, you know, we allow members to come out and see the farm. Um, but I mean, that doesn't hold us back. We have people all over the country um, from all sorts of genders and ages and, and, and cultural backgrounds. So it's really, really cool to see how many different people um, find an interest in it. Okay. <clears throat> so a question for Michael, will people here in the US be able to buy into horses from your international horses? Uh, it's a great question. And I wish I was smart enough to answer it. Uh, my lawyers are helping me kind of navigate that right now. So that unfortunately the short answer is not at the onset um, but you know, we're very confident they will. I mean, the, the premise is that we're going to create globalization. We want you to basically be across borders. We want you to be able to buy a fast net rock in, in Australia. We want you to be able to buy into, you know, you know, whatever types of bridge you're looking for across the country. It's going to take a little bit of time for us to get the regulatory framework right. So I would say in the short term, it's going to be kind of uh, local, locally based. And we're hoping within 12 to 18 months, we have what we did envision, which was that kind of truly global marketplace that you're not going to be bound by, uh, you're not going to be bound by borders. Well, I think this question was answered, but it's been asked again. So let me uh, run through it again. Can your members make money from the race earnings or the sale of the horses um, at, at public auction? So uh, Gary, maybe you can start with this uh, as far as, you know, uh, you had horses like Warriors Club make a lot of money. So, so how's that money distributed? Oh, you're, you're muted. Ours is set up as a total not-for-profit, and, mm -hmm. and we're upfront about that from the beginning. Obviously, with it being Churchill Downs and us being a publicly traded company, we had a few more handcuffs that we had to play by um, when we tried to go into this venture. So what we tried to do was create a totally separate entity from Churchill Downs Racetrack in, in the club. It's its own LLC. It's its own thing. Um, and, and we set it up on a not-for-profit basis. And uh, the idea is each horse is its own bucket of money, for example. So Warriors Club, yeah, he rattled off um, quite a bit of earnings. And what we did, you know, we, we talked to members after a year or two of fun with Warriors Club and Winter Circle Pictures and all the experiences that they had, you know, and we had this pot of money. The large majority said, let's buy more horses. Let's keep having fun. Let's see how long we can take this thing. No one wanted their $500 back because they had such an amazing time but on the ride and the journey that, that we took them on, they were all, you know, smitten with the success of the club. And, and so what we did was we bought four more horses, um, one each year and tried to continue to build on the success of, of what Warriors Club did. And some did well, some didn't. And, and ultimately, like any racing entity, you know, we, we've had some ups and downs. And so where, where that club ended up, just using it as a particular example, was um, all of our horses are retired. We donated almost $50,000 to different uh, second or charity, racing charity, uh, different uh, racing charity organizations. And we sent Warriors Club with a big fat check to the TRF for him to live out his life and people to be able to enjoy him and visit him. So, you know, that's just one club and it's its own entity. And what we're doing is reinvesting the money as it comes. So I would say as far as stable mates goes, we kind of tell people the same thing. It's more experience based um, because there is so much risk involved in racehorse ownership, um, but there is a chance for them to make money back. Um, we're just very upfront as we've all discussed, like Michael said, usually these horses are slower than we would like for them to be. Um, but at the end of the year, what we do is um, the, cum the cumul cumulative net earnings are distributed amongst all, all of the members. Um, so that's, you know, after the um, costs that have been involved for the Phillies and, and things throughout the year are, are deducted from the earnings made on the track, um, then it's split between all of the, the shareholders who um, uh, invested in that calendar year. 
Yep. And our, ours obviously was set up as a, a for-profit LLC. That's why it became qualified uh, with the SEC. Uh, and, you know, like we've talked about many times, it's a very high risk. Most, most horses don't make money. But what's kind of unique about this business, a lot of people kind of get into it. And I think this is super important for people to get their head around. When you look at kind of the economics of racing, you know, most horses will wind up losing money. But what happens is you have this kind of kind of small subset of horses that wind up having amazing appreciation, which is why I kind of go back to diversity. And so the reality is that's what it takes. And this game, from my perspective, when I look at the economics, is you have to get lucky once in a while to be able to kind of fund the joy. Actually, I think Gary kind of put it really well is that a lot of people just want to keep rolling and keep doing this, but you've got to have kind of a star once in a while. And so what happens is you invest in 10 horses, nine of them wind up losing money, but you hope that one really has a nice appreciation, sells as a broodmare prospect. Maybe you're lucky enough to, to have a stallion prospect, wherever it may be. And then you kind of use that money to kind of offset the losses and, and do what you want from there. So it definitely is set up as for profits, definitely set up to do diversification because you're really going to be very careful about looking at each individual horse as an investment. Um, and you got to look at it more in totality. It's, it's really portfolio kind of theory, which is the only way you can approach it, in my opinion. Hey, thank you. So one last question, then we'll wrap up, Simon. Um, so here's one. Do you think there's room for more racing clubs and more micro share groups? No, just, just me. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think there's definitely, I think there's lots, lots of angles. I'm sure there's tons of innovation that we haven't come up with. And so I hope there is. I think there's, I always talk about a number that there's 9 million people in the United States that say they have a, a curiosity and a, a passion uh, or a curiosity or interest in horse racing. And so I know I don't have even close to 9 million members. I don't want to speak for Gary or Mary, but I don't think they do as well. So if we can bring more people with innovation and creativity to try to get in, in front of what I believe is to be a very large addressable market, then the more the merrier rising tides lift all, all ships. And I'll be happy to be part of that. Yeah, wearing my Churchill Downs cap, uh, more the merrier. Let's get, let's get those clubs here and let's get that handle going. No, but I, I agree with Michael. Um, you know, competition in this game is sort of what it's all about. And, and I think when, when my racehorse has 5,000 people there and another entity, that, that's just fun. That's just good content. That's just um, good atmosphere. That, that's what we go to the races for. And if, if these clubs, if these groups, if these organizations can keep people uh, invested in the sport and engaged, that's helping everyone up from a breeder who's, you know, raising a horse that Michael's group may end up buying from, you know, a person who's going to, you know, have a wind star, uh, a mayor to a wind star stallion. That, that's what it's all about. The, the more the merrier for sure. Yeah, I completely agree. And as we touched on, we're all kind of doors for these people to step out into more resource ownership. So I think the more doors available, the better. Um, and I think there's so many different um, clubs and partnerships and syndicates out there that they all offer different things. As, as we found out on this panel, we've discussed we're all set up differently. And I think that's um, a great thing, like to have that diversity because they may pertain to different people better than others. And so people can really find partnerships that are the right fit for them. And, you know, these are ever growing in popularity. So I think we're going to see more continue to surface and I'm all for it. All right. Great job, guys. Unfortunately, uh, all good things come to an end. We could, I mean, I could sit here for another hour or so listening to all the information that I've garnished, but unfortunately our panel discussion has come to an end. Our Q&A has come to an end, none of which would have been possible without our sponsors. So I want to thank the Daily Racing Forum, the San International, and my race was to invest in the sponsorship here and, and, and gave us the ability to put this panel on. Uh, I wanna thank our three panelists, Gary, Mary, and Michael. I think if, you, if you've been watching this home, you have had great insight and expertise into how to open the door into, into horse racing. And uh, they've done a tremendous job. They've given us so much valuable information. You know where all their organizations are if you wanna contact them further going forward. But most of all, I want to thank everybody who's been sitting at home and watching, especially taking time out of their busy days. We hope that you learned something. In fact, I know you learned something with the three panelists we had. So uh, you've been very blessed to be able to, to dig into their knowledge and wherewithal. And we hope you're going to join us next month. For our next panel next month is biomechanics in horse racing. It's a little deeper next month into the biomechanics, but we hope you join us. Until then, be safe, be happy, and we hope you visit the winner's circle very often. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. Thank you.